you've had them with your spouse, you've had them uh, with your friends. And, and these discussions go something like this. Uh, when your kid does something great, uh, I'll often say to Nicole, oh, that's my boy, he did that. Or uh, Madison will bring home a, a good grade in school, that's my girl. You know? And then the flip side of that coin is they do something really dumb. And I'll say, well, she belongs to you. <laughs> parenting is difficult. Parenting is, is frustrating. Uh, parenting is also exhilarating. And, and, but the truth of the matter is, it, it becomes frustrating and becomes fulfilling in different ways. <clears throat> it becomes fulfilling when we see our kids excel, or when we see our kids really get it for the first time. You know, when you're when you're, uh, you see your, your kid hit the game-winning shot, and it's like, yes, you know, praise God for that. It's a fulfilling moment. But then when you see them blow it, it's not just frustrating that they made a mistake. Oftentimes, at least for me, I'm just going to speak for them. <coughs> one of the frustrating things is when they do make a mistake, it's a mistake that I see myself make. And the reason they're making it is because they see it in me. One of the things that uh, I've noticed over the years of being a parent is that my kids watch me very closely. And uh, one of the things that uh, I really like is superheroes. I love superhero movies. Um, in my opinion, there are not many bad superhero movies. I will go and I will watch every single one of them. And one of the, the great joys of being a father is that my boys tend to like those movies as well. I to look to see The Incredible Hulk. And uh, we both enjoy the movie, and as we're driving home, we're talking about it, he's all excited about it. And uh, the next day we had to go to church. And this is when we lived in Ohio. And Luke was in the nursery. And, uh, and uh, he's just a young kid at the time. And um, in, the, in the movie, The Hulk, in The Hulk, you know, really gets angry. Uh, one of his catchphrases is, Hulk smash, and then stuff breaks. Well, I hear this big bang come from the nursery. So I, I run back to the nursery, and my son Luke, who was, I think, three at the time, picked up a bolt much like this one, picks it up over his head, and throws it against the wall, and then he shouts, Hulk smash. <laughs> and... That's not one of those proud parenting moments. I walk into the nursery, and the nursery attendant tells me what happened, and I just said, I'm sorry, there are no words. You know, he, 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 I taught him it. <laughs> it's my fault. Um, but then just this morning, uh, my daughter Emma, who is also three years old, uh, she walks up into her bedroom and she looks around and she is a neat freak, which is really weird because she's three. She is just like her mom. <laughs> she walks into her bedroom this morning before I leave to come over to the church and she says, that room really needs to be cleaned up. I'm going to do that after I get home from school. I'm like, what is wrong with you? You're a three-year-old. But she follows after her mother. And that's both the beauty and the pain of parenting. The blessing and curse of parenting is that our children often follow in our footsteps. And in Genesis chapter 3, or chapter 4, we will see that this plays out, not just in our lives, but played out in the lives of Cain and Abel. They followed in their parents' footsteps. And God, through the course of uh, this chapter, Genesis chapter 4, is going to lay out some uh, fundamental principles, some guidelines uh, for parents as we attack this, uh, this great calling of raising children. And what we're going to see is that the parent is given a threefold role. And, and that uh, role consists of these three things. The role is to instruct, to encourage, and to discipline those in which God has entrusted to us. So let's jump in. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, the word of God says this. Now Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to Cain. She said, 
With the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel, and now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. So in this particular passage, we get principle number one, the, rule, the number one rule of a parent, and that is to instruct. And we see that God had blessed Adam and Eve with children. This is after the fall, mind you. Okay, and this ought to remind us of a couple of things. Number one, because we make a mistake doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. In fact, the, the contrary is true. We see in the first four chapters of the book of Genesis, the grace of God depicted in four different ways. And it's absolutely incredible. And yes, Genesis chapter 1 talks about the glory of creation. Genesis chapter 2 talks about the, the beauty of relationship. But Genesis chapter 3 really fouls everything up with the fall. But in those four first chapters, we see God depict grace four different ways. First, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we get the promise of grace where he says, uh, uh, the seed of the woman, the promised Messiah, will come and overcome this curse that's come upon the earth through man's sin. So we get the promise. Uh, the second way we see it, uh, grace, is we see it in the person. We see it in the person of Adam. Because the New Testament has this crazy verse that talks about how it was not Adam that was deceived, but it was the woman. And it talks about, also tells us that, uh, that Adam is this, this picture, this foreshadowing of Jesus. And when we piece all of that together, if, if Adam wasn't the one that deceived, was deceived, but it was the woman, that means that Adam chose to join his wife in the condition that she was in because he would rather spend eternity with her than live forever without her. Man, isn't that exactly what Jesus did? the creator of the universe, the very God of very gods, who dwelt in glory and knew not sin, came into this world, this veil of tears, and suffered as a consequence of our sin because we were so dear to him. So much so that he shed his blood so that we could be redeemed. So we see it in the promise, we see it in the person, but we also see that, uh, that this grace is, uh, is submitted to us through the provision. You remember after the fall and, and Adam and Eve had sinned, God didn't just kick them out of the garden. You know, he made coats of skin to cover over their nakedness. Something had to die so that they could be covered. He, should, he provided a way. It wasn't Adam. Adam didn't work real hard and earn his favor back with God. No, God made a way for them. Fourth and, and, and final way is that uh, God, in, in His in His mercy, in His grace, uh, shows up by um, by passing on this knowledge to His children, not just to Adam and Eve, but to Cain and Abel. His hand remains on Adam and Eve so much so that they are able to continue to have children. Okay? And, then, and then as I read this first passage of Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 4, we see uh, God giving them this gift of children. And, and the question that are, uh, arises, at least in my mind, is um, not only did they have children, but these children grew and knew what was expected of them before the Lord. They understood that a sacrifice had to be made, so they brought it. Abel, who is the farmer, brings the fruits of his hands. And, uh, and, and, and er, Cain, who is the farmer, brings the fruits of his hands. Abel, who is the, the shepherd, brings uh, forth uh, some of the fattened portions. And my question is, how did they know? The only way that they could have known what God expected of them is that their mother and father instructed them. They taught them. And this uh, leads us to this point. Our children learn how to live out their faith through our words and through our witness. Do you ever think about that? Our children learn how to walk with Jesus, not only by what we say,
but by how we live. Because let's just be honest, talk is really cheap. We can tell somebody the right way to do something, but if they don't see it in us, they don't see us specifically do the very things that we're telling them to do, then it just falls on deaf ears. Uh, think to uh, think out of the realm of spiritual and into the, the realm of the natural. If you've ever seen a young boy or a young girl learn how to play baseball, that's not something you can just instruct them how to do. You can't just teach them the theory. You can't just sit down and try to explain this game with all of these different moving parts and expect for them to understand it. No, you start with the base principles and then you tell them what you show them. Uh, something very simple is throwing a ball. When you're going to teach a, a young boy or a young girl how to throw a ball, you don't just teach them the theory and the, uh, the, uh, the physics of how to throw a ball. No, you take them out in the yard and you toss it with them. And, and not only are they listening to your words, but they're watching your motions. Because they need to see how it's done. Same thing's true with our faith. There are children that God has entrusted to us. They don't need just our words. Our words are vitally important. But they need to be instructed through how we live. And this is what happened with Cain and Abel. They understood that a sacrifice was necessary. It must be brought before God. And they learned that from their mother and father. Because God taught it to them. God taught Adam and Eve before he expelled them from the garden. Sin has to be dealt with, and it's through an offering. An offering a specific way. Blood must be shed so that that sin can be covered. And these young boys learn that from their parents. And, and, and God is consistent in this message. He tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, this famous passage, uh, verse 4 through 8, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. And, and love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And as you, uh, as you go and teach your children to obey His commands, do it as, uh, as you are walking along in life. As you're taking a stroll with them. Do it. Teach them uh, the things of the Lord and what He commands of them as you're sitting in bed, as you're getting ready to put them to sleep, as you're sitting in your living room and just having a casual conversation. Pour these things in to your children. They need to hear them from you. But more than that, they need to see them in you. And my question to you this morning is this. Whether you are raising children now or will raise them in the future, my question to you would be this. Can you say, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ? Can you say that to your children? And for you who don't have children, can you say that to your coworkers? Can you say that to your neighbors? Can you say that to your family members? Follow me as I follow Christ. Because the truth of the matter is this, people are watching. Whether they be the children that God has entrusted to you, or whether they be your closest friend, people are watching. And what they're watching is Jesus at work in your life. So what is it that your life is teaching them? Because God has given each of us the role to instruct. Do we take that role seriously? But not only did he call a parent to instruct, he called a parent to encourage. Let's pick it up in verse uh, 5 through 7. <clears throat> The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But Cain and his offering, he did not look, on, look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do what is wrong, or if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at its door. And it desires to have you that you must rule over him. So God says, not only are we called to instruct our children, teach them the right way, to teach them the truth in purity, to show them the truth, but it goes further than that. Our role is to encourage our children. And we see this happen here with Cain. Cain uh, both Cain and Abel bring the offering. We, we saw that in the first passage. But Abel brought the offering the way that the Lord showed his father, Adam. Something had to die. 